Uh, hi, I'm Chester. Um, I'm a fourth year medical student. And today I want to take you on a journey through medical school and through my own personal experience as a young adult finding his way through life. So today I'll be sharing with you about my motivation to join medicine, the challenges I've faced along the way, how mindfulness has come into play, and lastly, I'll share a bit on what I find necessary for a holistic education. So the foundation is the most important bit of any building. I have friends who've decided that medicine was going to be a stable profession to build their future families on, and there are definitely those that are in it for the money. But I'm a little bit more naive than that. And so for me, meaning has always played the most important role. They started in the misty distant memories of the past. I knew from a young age while on a trip with my grandmother that I wanted to be in the line of healing others. Uh, it was late at night, I remember, and I was watching my grandmother doze off on the bus on the way back to the hotel. And then a strong sadness overcame me, and I just thought about how I couldn't stand to see her suffer as she grew older, and how I would like to be in a position to ease any suffering when it arose. So this was a memory from my formative years that stuck with me as I applied for medical school as I did my interviews, and as I was accepted. But the moment that med school started proper, that important motivation for me to become a doctor started to recede a little further into the past. You see, med school is not the easiest place to be in. It's the unspoken compact we make when we enter in exchange for your time, your energy, and your emotions. You get a pretty secure job at the end of the day. So from day one, you start by learning the nitty gritty details about the anatomy of the human body. You learn what every single fiber and cell does, whether it's sending an electrical signal to your brain or fighting off microbial invaders. And the amount of information that we have to learn increases at alarming rates. We are asked to memorize, analyze, compile this information and relate them to what we see in patients. And I think that in itself would be okay. I think that as products of the Singaporean education system, most students can just hold up at home or in the library and just memorize whatever they need. You know, uh, we are taught pretty good, we are taught pretty well about that. But this profession also requires us to interact with others. And to that end, we need to build resilient emotion regulation and top-notch PR skills. You know, the school regularly reminds us about the need for professionalism, so often that it's a part of our yearly exams. So we put on an understanding face as we go around the hospital, speaking with patients, and we just sit there trying to gain as much medical information from them while deftly maneuvering around their emotions. You spend the whole day showing empathy and compassion, and then by the end of the day, by the time we reach home, you've got nothing left other than tiredness and apathy. You know, we give so much empathy to the people that we see that sometimes we have none left for ourselves. So I finished my third year of medicine back in June, which was our, my first clinical year. And there's this catch-all nickname for medical students when we are around in the wards. You know, we call ourselves space-occupying lesions because we're usually just bumbling around, taking up space, and not being directly useful to the care of the patient. And then sometimes you have the consultants, you know, these experts in their respective fields, asking students questions to try really tease out the understanding. Yeah, but the thing is, with the stress of the spotlight placed on you in front of the whole team, from the most junior house officer to the registrars, that sometimes it doesn't really matter whether you know the answer or not. You know, you just freeze up and jumble your words 
until things don't really make sense. You know, and then the consultant will go, uh, it's okay, never mind, never mind, move on, move on. And then he'll move on to explaining the right answer. But then it feels like you let down everyone around you, you know, all the seniors who just who graduated medicine so many years ago, and you should know all this information. Yeah. So I had to get used to feeling like an imposter in a crowd of overachievers. You know, here you find someone with near perfect memory, or someone who's winning awards left, right, center or someone who's publishing multiple research papers a month. And it always made me wonder if I was adequate, if I belonged. And this feeling of not belonging slowly grew into isolation and into questioning whether my desire to be a healer actually lined up with my ability. Not many people can relate to the worries and concerns of a medical student, apart from those in the healthcare sector. Emotions tend to run high, and it's not always very understandable for family and friends. You know, there's this expectation to perform because there's no undo button when it comes to life or death. Medicine becomes such a large part of my life that sometimes it seems like there's nothing else. Sometimes, when I spend time with friends from other faculty, I can't really relate to the conversation, bidding for courses, modules, projects, presentations. We don't really have any of these. We are always a little bit out of touch from the rest of our peers, and it's not very difficult to see why. So after a while, you buckle down and focus on school, because no one can help you study other than yourself. I think especially for me, when I started my clinical rotations in the hospital, I let myself be taken away by the work of studying, swept away into an unending abyss of knowledge. I got this major tunnel vision, and my life became very survival-focused. Just finish today, learn a bit for tomorrow, and try not to fall asleep in the meantime. So I didn't create the time and the space to focus on myself, and so my life got small, a little smaller every day. And then some when during my first clinical year, I came to the realization that something was wrong. As I became more apathetic with each passing day, I grew more impermeable to suffering. I think it was probably a subconscious reflex to the amount of pain I saw every day so that I could ignore my feelings and just focus on studying the textbooks. Until one day, when I was in the pediatric ICU, standing by the bed of a kid who had some genetic condition that landed him in the hospital hooked up to a ventilator. He couldn't have been more than two, you know. I stood there, going through the checklist, growth looks stunted, patient in obvious respiratory distress, and then surrounded by the doctors and other medical students, I just stopped doing that for a moment. Suddenly, I was aware of my apathy. Why didn't I feel anything? Shouldn't I be feeling something more? So I stood next to that child's bedside, and I swear I had to dig deep to pull up some semblance of empathy for that suffering kid. And that's when I knew that something was wrong with me. It shouldn't have been this difficult to feel. Compassion shouldn't have to take this much effort. And at that moment, I was treating patients as a constellation of symptoms and signs, as a puzzle to be solved, as a problem to be managed. I objectified them and only cared about them as much as I could get information and knowledge out of them. Then I knew something had to change. So how did I come to know mindfulness, and how has it changed the trajectory of my journey? I wanted to start off with this quote from Mindfulness in Plain English, which is a book that really pushed me towards more consistent practice. And the quote is, you can't make radical changes in the pattern of your life until you begin to see yourself exactly as you are now. And immediately off the top of your head, wouldn't you agree with this statement? Anyone who has used a map before knows this intuitively. You need to know where you are to guide you to where you're going. And likewise, 
to enact change and to develop yourself, it is important to start with knowing thyself. So I was introduced to mindfulness through the medical dharma circle. I had many experienced seniors and teachers who were essential along my path towards mindfulness. So full disclosure, I'm not the most disciplined of students and it really took a great deal of effort to build mindfulness into my daily practice. It took quite a few false starts before I found the habit of mindfulness essential. And I think everyone who has practiced mindfulness for some time will agree that the benefits of mindfulness takes time to manifest. I found that over time, I was better at focusing, at sitting in my chair for hours, and not getting distracted too easily. You know, when you study with your computer, when you do work off your iPad, it's so easy to just change tabs, change windows, and end up watching YouTube or playing some games. But mindfulness taught me to call my mind back to the present as I reminded myself of the purpose I set out before opening my laptop. Now, I would meditate a little at the start of the day to set the mood. I also meditate at the end of the day to relieve myself of some stress and anxiety. When I'm on quiet buses and trains, I will close my eyes and try to get some breath meditation done too. During stressful periods, such as when I have more deadlines or when exams are coming up, I would set aside a little more time every day to practice meditation. Now, as I can't really take a picture of myself meditating in the middle of the wards, you guys can have one of me meditating by a pond in Botanic Gardens. So an interesting thing I noticed is that the way time passes in the hospital is quite different. You know, there are days when I get to the hospital at 6 and by lunchtime, it really feels like it's been a whole day. And then there are days when there are, when there are just so many interesting things happening all at once that I don't really realize it's 6 p.m. and I should probably head home. I guess it's interesting mostly in contrast to my experience when I meditate. When I meditate, I feel the presence of time surrounding me. Every second lengthens, every minute grows. Let me share with you a story of how I used mindfulness in the hospital. So there was once when I was asked by a rather scary consultant to present about a patient during morning rounds. So I clocked and I talked to the patient in the morning before round started and I wrote my notes down in my iPad. And then when round started, I could just feel the anxiety building up as we got closer and closer to my patient. And then right as I stood beside my patient's bedside, with everyone staring at me and waiting for me to present, I could feel myself succumbing to the anxiety. My heart was beating faster. I could feel the I could hear the blood rush in my ear. My breathing became faster and shallower. My hands started pouring out sweat. And in that moment, it seemed as though time had suddenly accelerated. And all that was ringing in my mind were a hundred voices telling me to do different things. That I was an idiot who got something wrong. That the patient was going to correct me in front of the whole team. Or that the consultant was going to call me out in front of everyone for getting my information so utterly wrong. And it's in these moments where mindfulness comes in handy. You know, something in my mind recognized that I was facing an acute stress reaction. And just by naming what I was going through, I was able to take action to deal with it. I took three deep breaths, and that got me moving. And you know what? It wasn't that bad after all. Sure, I was probably stuttering a little here and there, but nothing really bad happened. The, consult the consultant said thank you, and the team just proceeded to discuss management for the patient. The reality just wasn't as bad as the scenarios that my imagination cooked up. What are you supposed to do when you face suffering on a daily basis? When every day is another reminder that illness comes to everyone, that old age is around the corner, and that death is inevitable. 
I have seen a wide range of doctors throughout my postings in the hospitals. Some take suffering like a personal enemy to conquer. Others appear to move on very quickly. You know, emotions are really like these contagious little creatures rampaging in our minds. When faced with distress, it becomes important to understand what emotions are yours and what emotions you're getting off the other party. Where is this pity arising from? Why am I feeling anger? There is no substitute for self-understanding and awareness of your own mind. If I'm not careful, I'll be dragged around by one patient's life story and another patient's agony, that by the end of the day, I'm all wrung out. We're all human, and our effort and energy is finite. When we feel compassion towards another, we must remember to feel an equal part for ourselves. Although it is difficult, when I step out of the hospital, I try to remind myself that I cannot carry this baggage with me, that I must let go, that life is a marathon, and that nobody can save everyone. So, to stop ourselves from being washed away by this endless river of thoughts, we should pick a focal point in the present and immerse ourselves into it completely. When you walk, focus on the walking. When you drink tea, focus on drinking the tea. When you watch lightning flash in the sky, focus on it for the split second that it is present. Take every moment to be a meditative experience. And in each moment that you find a deep sensation, the mind orchestra rings out again and again. This is wonder. This is joy. And then I sit there and bask in the moment, letting myself immerse in the experience and the emotions. You let yourself know, I am here. I have arrived. And it is in this present moment, in the spirit of today, that we must live our lives. The past is immutable and the future is unknowable. And so, unique challenges require unique solutions. Other than mindfulness, I continuously sought to expand my perspective, to, ex to educate myself on the things that school will never teach. And so the way I see it, there are a few ways of knowing the world. And here I listed three, science, art, and philosophy. So quantitative theories and dosing schedules can't tell you what to do when you become numb in the face of suffering. When the science of medicine fails in providing a line of emotional release to, for doctors, students, and patients, we must turn to alternatives like philosophy and art. So through the thought and the work of great thinkers, we educate and differentiate and deliberate over concepts. We transcend our mortal shells and open ourselves up to new possibilities for the future when we contemplate together with the giants of the past. The love of wisdom teaches us to look beyond ourselves. They guide us to the realization that we are all interconnected and that life is lived in the present. And through the art of being human, we ideate and create and calibrate ourselves spiritually and holistically. We open ourselves up to inexplicable affective states when we watch a movie or listen to a concert. And we become receptive emotionally and learn to be less guarded, less controlled. The arts teach us to remember the person in the needs and the deeds that we see. This is not just a patient. This is not just a doctor. These are complex human beings that you can't just brush over with a thin stroke of paint. Each and every one of them are living, breathing people who have something to teach us. And so how did I teach myself beyond the science-based curriculum that I was stuck in? I went in search of myself. I sought out parallels and possibilities and everything that makes us human. I dug deep and I searched widely and I found joy and spirit and hope and the beauty that today that this very moment can bring. I taught myself to really appreciate relaxing as I sat in my hammock, reading away as the waves washed up against the shores and the hot summer sun battered at the treetops. I taught myself 
to be fearless in the self-expression of the theater. And I learned how to contemplate as I gazed out into the sea at night. I found awe staring at this painting in the National Gallery with its enormous size and the tangible emotions I could feel coming off the artwork. I pushed myself to seek communities outside the circles I was already in. I found my caring nature as I did my best to raise these succulents. Unfortunately, they all died a few months later. And I'll keep trying with the plants. For me, it was about doing different things. Things that didn't parallel my path in medicine enabled me to see in a broader light. Textbooks can't teach you lateral thinking and creativity. Things like tree planting were so different from the linear processing that I was dealing with every day. I found renewed purpose as I went out into the community and saw the lives of those who needed help. A holistic education is about learning to be receptive to things that we don't do normally and finding yourself listening to unfamiliar music. Maybe it's about trying out something new, somewhere new. It's about the places we go to lose ourselves, to refresh our minds and find meaning. And sometimes it's about being all alone, going away from everyone, to find solitude, to cut off all external distractions and examine your own mind. It's about waking in the morning and finding meaning to carry on. It's about going to bed at night and finding the struggle worth everything. Because if you don't find meaning in how you live, how can you find meaning in what you do? If we don't widen our experience, if we don't find ways to expand the scopes of our lives, we'll end up with tunnel vision and become yet another rat in the rat race. It takes effort to choose over and over again to devote time and energy to the pursuit of things that are beyond the train tracks of our lives. But it is always worth it. On the real way to becoming a doctor, I will learn to diagnose, I will learn to treat, and I will learn how to heal. But outside, beyond school, I will learn how to allocate value to myself. I will learn how to sing my own stories. I will learn how interconnected our lives are with each other, how all webs intertwine, and how intermeshed our narratives are. And so before I end, I just wanted to share about this patient that I met during my stint in SGH. He was a very cheerful 80-year-old gentleman who had been in and out of the hospital quite often for some heart issues, but it's not the medical part that drew my attention. So for over an hour, he shared with me how he was still working as an insurance agent at 80, 80. He shared about his family, his thoughts about society, and instead of patient and student, it became two people talking and listening. There was nothing too special about the interaction, no sudden realizations or insights into the nature of the world. But I learned something very simple that day. You know, no matter how powerless we are to change the circumstance of another, the least we can do is to sit by them, listen, and be present. Thanks. Thank you.